All right, we'll get going here. Welcome to today's Strategic Farming Let's Talk Crops program. We're happy that you've joined us for today's session on four different forage topics. Uh, I'm Nathan Drutz, a regional extension educator for crop production based out of Rochester. And today we're welcoming Anthony Hansen and Craig Schaefer here. Uh, Anthony is a regional educator out of Morris, and Craig Schaefer is our forage extension agronomist here uh, for the University of Minnesota. Uh, again, these sessions are brought to you by the University of Minnesota Extension with generous support from the Minnesota Soybean Research and Promotion Council, as well as the Minnesota Corn and Research Promotion Council. With that, I will turn it over to our speakers for today. We're going to start with Craig, if you want to go ahead and go uh, first here. Hello there. Um, I want to talk to you about some alfalfa issues, and if you have any additional questions, uh, please, please send them in. Uh, this time of the year um, is always, I always think, uh, what's, what's the status of alfalfa coming out of the winter? What's it going to be like uh, in the spring in terms of planting? And um, I kind of want to give you some summary of what, what I think we are right now. Um, I think I wrote an article in December. It was called Let It Snow. And I didn't really <laughs> anticipate that it was going to snow as much as it did. But it's good for alfalfa because we've had like six inches of snow or more, much more, in many areas. Uh, and this is really good because it protects the alfalfa plants from these variations in, in soil temperatures or air temperatures. So in terms of that plant, it's coming out of the most dormant stage that it is normally is like in January, starting to can break dormancy if it warms up, but you see, we got the good snow cover to protect it. And the other factor is our soil temperatures are at or near freezing uh, right now. And some of them are thawed, some of our soils are thawed. So um, I, I think we, we have no problem uh, right now with alfalfa projecting alfalfa winter hardiness. The other, um, other factors in the winter that are, are an issue um, are things, factors such as ice sheeting and um, ice sheeting uh, caused by accumulation of, of melted snow, uh, for example, can be a problem. Um, but with our soil temperatures high and the potential for rapid total thaw thawing of the profile, I really think we should be in uh, good shape there with very little ice sheeting this year, but it could happen. For those of you who are concerned about ice sheeting uh, for alfalfa, we're really looking at three to four weeks of ice coverage causing uh, injury, death to plants. Um, ice sheeting is basically asphyxiates alfalfa plants. You get accumulation of, of ethanol and other compounds in the soil. Um, I'd be surprised if we have as much ice sheeting this year as we normally do. Another thing that usually gets us this time of year going into April is heaving, and that's the jacking up of alfalfa roots. We could still have problems with that if we get if moist soils and freezing and thawing. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot we can do about heaving. Um, once it happens, um, I can tell you that um, planting alfalfa with a grass is very beneficial in reducing heaving, uh, but um, when it happens and when plants are heaved out more than an inch, uh, there's usually issues uh, with its survival, the plant's survival and productivity of the stands. So I'm optimistic about alfalfa this year uh, and going into the spring, uh, it could be early, this could drag out more longer than we thought, but I really encourage you to seed alfalfa as early as you can and um, take advantage of the growing season. You can get another cut in if you see it in April. In many parts of the state, get another ton of forage off of it. So um, be ready for seeding as, as soon as you can. Obviously, I think seeding alfalfa is more important than seeding corn, um, but you know, growers will have different preferences about what they get in earlier. Uh, the, uh, the other, uh, the other thing that we should be aware of this time of the year, or that we have an opportunity to, to do frost seeding. 
And frost seeding, as the name implies, is sprinkling seed on top of the ground. And the ground then, through freezing and thawing, buries the seed. And when that happens, we can have potentially have a legume there, which wasn't there before. Frost seeding is something you can do in pastures if they've been preconditioned to disrupt the vegetation. Um, it can be also something you can do in small grains that have been seeded in the fall when you want to get a legume in there and even keep it for one year. It's in a, in a, an approach to, to do that seeding. Uh, finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, I mentioned fertilizer. Uh, I don't know what fertilizer costs are, they've dropped, uh, but I would uh, recommend that um, recommend to get out and do soil testing to for, for be aware of the, your, your needs of, of all nutrients, but for alfalfa, particularly potash. Um, and also uh, be aware of the, your sulfur situation. If you, you have low organic matter soils, um, sulfur is an economical way to increase your yield. So I think that's where I'll stop, Nathan, as a general overview. And um, I'll uh, turn it over to uh, Anthony. All right. As we said before, if you've got questions about anything here, make sure to put that in the Q&A box so that we could get those questions answered. So, yep. Anthony, you're up next. Sure. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on with our alfalfa insects out there. Just a second here. There we go. All right. Um, Nathan, are things showing up fine on your end there? You're showing us presenter okay. mode at the moment. Oh, all right. Thank you. We'll get that swapped here. Okay, there we go. So, uh, like uh, I said, we're... Oh, there you go. There you... Oh, you're good. All right. We're always going to have some, you know, snafus when we're trying to figure out Zoom still. Um, but yeah, no, uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about what's going on with alfalfa weevil, especially, um, but a little bit what's going on kind of the other insects out there, because that kind of relates in a little bit. Um, so like Nate mentioned, I'm a uh, regional extension educator based out of Morris. I work on IPM. So this is integrated pest management, really just working with everything we have in the toolbox there. Obviously we got our pesticides, but this is definitely a case where we're looking at some of our other kind of control methods we have, natural enemies, um, things like mowing come into play a lot for our pest management for alfalfa here too. So we're really just trying to figure out what works best for pest management, both in terms of those of us who um, you know, have our alfalfa ourselves. I mean, I still uh, work on my family's farm and um, have beef cattle, so we're still actively managing for alfalfa weevil, especially in the last few years in central Minnesota. So um, really seeing what works best, both for just controlling the pests, but you know what really makes sense financially too. All right, uh, so our alfalfa insects, common ones we deal with. Um, there are some sporadic ones out there. We're going to see things like uh, P. aphid, uh, cutworms, blister beetles on occasion. That's when especially if folks have uh, horses instead. That's one to keep an eye out for. Um, our cattle are you know, a little more resistant to that. They don't care quite as much um, in terms of uh, digestion issues there. But what we're really looking for are alfalfa weevil early in the season, and then maybe not as major of a pest most years, but occasionally in late season, we'll be looking at potato leaf hopper too. Um, but here I'm gonna focus on alfalfa weevil first, and then we'll kind of talk a little bit about potato leaf hopper coming up later. Um, so for our alfalfa IPM, um, one of the things we really want to keep in mind is that we do have those free control um, tools out there, and that's our natural enemies, a lot of our insects out there, helping basically keep the bad insect populations down. Um, so if you have insurance insecticides out there, or just if you're needing to spray a lot, you can get flare-ups because of that. So just keep that in mind. Um, you know, if you get away without needing to treat one year, that can help you out a lot in the long run. Because um, we do talk about this lost biological control uh, pretty often, wondering if that's maybe causing some of the issues I'll be talking about coming up here. Um, but there are some other issues coming up too, like our um, insecticide resistant populations. So if you're over in the soybean world, we talk about soybean aphid a lot, resistance to pyrethroids. Well, short preview, uh, we likely are looking at that same situation for alfalfa weevil here. And we're worried about that with other insects too. But we're also looking at our input costs. Um, some of these, especially for alfalfa, you know, is it really worth what you're doing out there? And Nathan and I were talking earlier about the fungicide side of things, um, kind of looking at some of those too. And 
you know, it's really one where we do want to think about our inputs there. So alfalfa weevil, if you haven't seen it before, this is a blown up picture of it. Um, it has a black head capsule to it. Keep that one in mind. Um, you kind of see this distinctive kind of white stripe along the side. Um, it's a beetle larva, so you're not going to have additional legs in the back side of it. It's basically all in the front. Um, there is a lookalike that has a brown head capsule instead. Um, that is a cloverleaf weevil. I have had calls and folks, you know, early, early in the season thinking, oh, I already have, you know, a few alfalfa weevil larvae out there. And you know, it turns out it was just cloverleaf weevil. Wasn't really an issue. Most of the time, it's not going to be um, economic damage from that one. One to keep an eye on. But if you're seeing brown head capsules out there, not a lot of black ones, just know you're not dealing with alfalfa weevil quite yet. But do keep an eye out still. All right, so if you haven't seen it before, alfalfa weevil, what that one is doing, it's feeding on the leaves of the plant. It skeletonizes them, so you kind of can get a window painting look from afar, or you'll see just kind of the leaf veins left on the plants here. Uh, historically, and, and this is something we can talk a little bit about later, Craig, is, um, you know, it used to be we'd deal with one generation per year, and that was it. Um, you know, if we managed our first cutting pretty well, usually we didn't have to deal with alfalfa weevil past that, maybe a little bit in the second cutting, but that was kind of sporadic. Um, things are changing a little bit for our management plans. So that's why I say historically, and that's why we're here today talking about this. So uh, just a couple other pictures. Um, alfalfa weevil, they go through different instars, basically the immature larvae, or the grubs are the ones that are eating on the plants. So they start off small, like the one on the bottom here. Um, then they'll kind of increase in size to go through four different um, molts or instars there. So eventually when you get to the fourth last instar, that one kind of in the middle up top, uh, those are, you know, the fattest, largest ones. They're doing the most feeding there. But once they get to that point, that's when they'll go, uh, basically think about butterflies and other things. They go through that pupation stage, um, and then turn into adults. So that's happening, uh, you know, roughly, you know, around oh, mid-June into July or so. Then once they turn into adults, this picture I have up in the upper right, they're basically not feeding anymore. Um, they'll, they go into basically summer dormancy. Uh, and they're not laying eggs really until the next year. Now, there may be some changes to that too, um, but I bring up the adults because I also get calls sometimes people are out there sweeping up a sweep net and they'll find you know high numbers, they say, of alfalfa weevil. And I have to ask them, like, are you finding adults or larvae? Larvae are the damaging stage. If you're just finding adults uh, later in the season, you really don't know what's going to be happening the next year. Um, but if it was you know early this year into May and you're finding adults, that's just your sign you need to be out there scouting. It's really not an indication yet that you're going to be having um, major damage yet from the larvae eventually. So just remember that one. Um, don't be out there counting adults when we're doing scouting. And basically those adults, what they're doing, they're laying eggs in the plant. So those will be hatching out. You're not going to get major damage from egg lay really, but it's really just that they're sheltered in the plant. So remember that one there. All right. So I mentioned those natural enemies earlier. Uh, basically remember that alfalfa weevil, it's actually not native. It's another one of those invasive species out there, except this one has been around for ages. Um, 1904 is when it was introduced. So this one you know, we've been dealing with for over a hundred years, uh, but about, you know, roughly around the eighties or so, uh, there were some parasitoid wasps from its native range that were introduced. So again, back to the natural enemies. Uh, this is a case where they actually suppress weevil populations really well but they're also really susceptible to our insecticides, especially ones like our pyrethroids, those broad, broad spectrum ones. And this is one of the things we're kind of wondering is like, okay, did something happen to the natural enemies out there? Um, are those populations getting suppressed? And is that why we're seeing flare-ups of alfalfa weevil? So that's one part of the puzzle here. So uh, folks haven't been scouting for alfalfa weevil before. It's actually you know, pretty straightforward. Um, you can go ahead kind of for us entomologists, we have, those uh, sweep nets, bug nets out there, we're out there sweeping with those in fields. You can get a hold of one of those. It's a 15 inch diameter sweep net to standardize things. Um, but if you don't have one of those, the main things that we're using are literally just a shears, a uh, five gallon bucket and a hand lens. So what you're gonna be doing, uh, one, you can take that sweep net, just check to see if larvae are present. You'll probably see adults out there too if you're taking that sweep net. Um, but it's not the most reliable method for getting counts out there. So uh, those larvae, they kind of stick to the plant pretty well. Uh, so what you're going to want to do instead is actually cut 30 stems across the field at ground level. Uh, at that point, you're just going to shake those into your five-gallon buckets. You're really going to hit those larvae hard so they fall to the bottom. And that way you get a little bit better account of what's happening in the field. Now also remember, um, 
you're getting that plant height as well. We're going to use that for figuring out uh, some treatment thresholds a little bit later. And one of the goals we'll be looking at here is, you know, you're out there scouting, but if you're 16 inches getting close to the early bud stage, that's the point where you might be mowing earlier. So keep that one in mind. It's not all just based on our um, insecticide use here. And I do like to throw this one up here. Some folks do ask about, so, okay, what actually, what is the actual yield loss from alfalfa weevil? Um, so this graph is just defoliation uh, down at the bottom here, and then you have your yield reduction over on the left. So you can get around, you know, 30, a little bit over 40% yield loss in some cases, um, but that's with really heavy defoliation, in this case, looking around 80, 90% defoliation. So just remember, you are still going to get, you know, a bit um, of your plants, even if you have defoliation out there, that's pretty heavy, but kind of more lower case than this here, if you're around 50% defoliation, you know, 10 to 20% yield loss, that's still you know, a good chunk there. So that's why we're out there scouting. And this is uh, an example of what the thresholds look like. We do have resources online. If you just want to um, search online, alfalfa weevil uh, thresholds, and you'll see those through U of M or the universities. And these are basically based on your hay value. Um, there are different ranges uh, some of these tables have. But then you're looking at stem height, which you mentioned earlier, and then your treatment cost per acre. So in some of these cases, we're going to be looking at, um, you know, really what divides out by stem height. So first, it would kind of work our way down. Um, earlier, kind of mid-vegetative stages, if you reach threshold, so um, if you hit the average number of larvae per stem that matches up with, with the categories in this table, we're mainly looking at insecticide treatments. But you'll kind of see a theme as we get later and later into that individual crop. Uh, late vegetative stages, you want short pre-harvest interval insecticides. So remember pre-harvest interval, that's just the uh, amount of time you have from application to how long you need to wait basically until you can harvest. So some of our insecticides, uh, they're quite a bit longer than say three days. Uh, so you may not have a window anymore that works for some of those. So that's one constraint there. As you get closer, like I mentioned, early bud, um, you know, like for someone like me, who's also a beef producer, you know, we're not as picky on our alfalfa, so we might let it go a little bit later, but, um, if you have, you know, high numbers out there and you're maybe only a couple days away from when you really would plan to mow anyways, maybe just go ahead and plan to say, okay, we're just going to do it early. Um, that's going to help you out a little bit in terms of getting those larvae, uh, you know, basically run through a mower. If they're going through the disc spine, you think about, you know, you are getting some damage to them that way. But the main thing is think about a nice just mode field, um, especially when things are raked up, you have a lot of exposed ground. Those larvae really don't have much protection uh, getting exposed to the element. That is one way you can help kill off the larvae a bit. Now here's a challenge when we talk about our um, insecticide use. Pyrethroid resistance, these are the group threes. It's been confirmed to have resistance in Western states. Now uh, we were trying to do this last year in Minnesota. We couldn't quite get enough uh, Larvae, it was just a little bit too late in the season to send it off for sampling, but we are getting plenty of reports of field failures here in Minnesota. So it's not officially confirmed yet, but uh, we're at the point where highly suspected, very likely that it's here too. Um, but the, the short of this one is that some of these uh, states do have variability where they find resistance. You can find pockets, um, maybe not a high proportion of fields in some cases, others, uh, high numbers of fields do have resistance. So it really depends on your field history. I mentioned uh, kind of your mowing and raking a little bit. Think about those windrows a little bit in this picture here I have. What if, you know, let's say it rained, you have wet hay, and that hay is sitting out there a little bit. You have some alfalfa growing up through the windrows again. Well, those weevils are concentrated in those windrows, and they have protection in that case. They're not exposed to the sun. So that's why we say mow early, but then also make sure, do your best to be able to get out there and bail it up quickly, both raking if you're doing that and bailing it up. If you can get that protection off the ground, that's going to avoid issues that will show up in a little bit here. Now for insecticides, we have some options out there. But now remember, we've lost a couple uh, control methods out there already um, in our organophosphates. These are the group 1B one, uh, one in this case. I don't have clear pure phos in there anymore. That's when we used a lot for alfalfa weevil. It's not available anymore. Uh, so just remember that one if you do have it on hand. Um, not an option you can use for your fields anymore. That's when you'd have to uh, make sure it's properly disposed of. Um, but in this case, we're focusing on the group threes, the pyrethroids. So it seems like we have a lot of active ingredients. Again, if you've uh, seen some of the talks we've had on uh, soybean aphid, it's a very similar situation. 
we're basically to the point now where we're really not recommending the pyrethroids very much. If you have a history of field failures, um, you might be able to get by with pyrethroids still if you don't have um, past issues in your field with alfalfa weevil and a pyrethroid not working. So uh, try to keep that one in your toolbox if you can still, but there's a likely situation where these won't work for a lot of folks now. So we're looking at our other insecticides we have out there. So we have those group ones. Um, if I could get into this uh, malathion or phosmet, sometimes you'll see uh, combinations of these two. If they're used individually, you only get about 50% control. So it's um, you know not the best individually. So if you're using those products, try to see if you can get a combination of those two. Um, in that case, then you can get pretty decent control. It's getting closer to 90% or so. Another one in this uh, carbamate group here, uh, you might hear about this uh, from gardeners at seven dust. Well, we can also use uh, um, carbaryl in this case, the active. You can use that for alfalfa, but uh, it can burn your crop after cutting. So you have to be careful about that one. One of the main ones we are um, seeing folks are relying on now without our pyrethroids really being a good option is indoxicar. This is this group 22 at the bottom. So remember these group numbers, you're always wanting to rotate through those. Um, Stewart is a trade name. The challenge is last year, a lot of folks had trouble getting a hold of it. It was just in high demand, hard to find. So just keep that one in mind. Um, hopefully we have you know more supply this year, but that's one that is working well for folks. No documented case of resistance so far, but we don't want to rely on that one too much. So we end up like the pyrethroids there. So we're going to change recommendations a little bit on the insecticide side of things. So one is um, make sure you're rotating those group numbers. So we've lost pyrethroids potentially. So what's going to happen there? We have our group ones, organophosphates, and group 22s left. So that's just the bare minimum to be able to rotate there if you have resistance issues you suspect in your field. But here's another wrinkle in there. One of the new recommendations coming out across um, you know, the US and our region is that you don't apply that same group within three years. So if you apply a group one uh, this year, then you have to wait uh, three years to be able to apply that one again. So what happens if you can't use your pyrethroids, you have resistance there? That's where we're trying to fall back on IPM. Can you look at mowing and hopefully get by with that one year where you don't have to treat or be out there scouting to make sure you aren't using one, one of those groups and we don't need it? So uh, just keep that one in mind. We're really kind of in dire straits for insecticide availability. Um, I've had calls from organic growers too, and they have even fewer options. Uh, spinosad is one of the actives that can be used there. It gets expensive using that one. Um, and there's some efficacy to that one. Um, I think I saw about 75% mortality in some trials I was looking up at that one. So there is an option there uh, for some organic growers, but some of their other ones, they'll also, also fall into this group three as well. So they're looking at similar issues. Other thing, make sure you're using high label rates. If you use low rates, it means quicker resistance. Basically, you're just getting enough out there to maybe kill off some of the insects. But if you have a few surviving, that just means those resistance traits can build up even easier. All right, so that's one prong of what's going on with alfalfa weevil. Number two, though, we're seeing what looks like an extended weevil season. Um, so these are just maps I tend to make up every year. It's uh, degree days like we do for our crops, except we can do it for insects. Uh, so what's happening is over the season, you're going to get development. You're going to go through all those different instars of the larvae. Once you hit the pupil stage, that's when we would say you can end scouting, um, basically because this is a one generation per year pest. Uh, once they get into that pupil stage in the summer adults, they're inactive, not feeding anymore. So in this map, this is about June 2nd, and then we'd say that's roughly around, you know, close to our border at that point is when folks wouldn't have been able to stop scouting in that case. So what's changing there? Well, here's a couple of fields I had in West Central Minnesota, um, a little later in June into July, when we should have been done with our uh, weevil season. So over on the left, this is by Morris here. Um, you can see what happened in the windrows there. We're getting patches like this where we had heavy weevil feeding. Um, this is one where even though they uh, managed to get things bailed up relatively quick, uh, there's just enough kind of regrowth going on um, or enough time in there that the weevils are feeding on the regrowth and that affected that crop where you had you know, pretty severe stand issues there. Now over on the right, this is kind of a combination of uh, drought issues and weevil feeding I saw by Alexandria. This is one where the whole middle of the field looked like it had heavy weevil feeding, plus uh, just the dried out area of the field too. Um, so in combination, uh, we're seeing some issues, but that Alexandria field was literally, I think it was July 1st or 2nd, 
I usually you wouldn't see issues that late. Um, so what it's looking like is we have a different strain coming in potentially. Um, there could be some overwintering things where um, I know Craig was talking about our snow cover, great for alfalfa, also great for the insects overwintering in there. It really hasn't gotten cold enough to kill off something like alfalfa weevil, um, unless you had a bare exposed ground. But in this case, we're kind of looking a little bit more at this western strain that's coming in. And what happens is um, we have an eastern strain in Minnesota, typically, this uh, newish strain to Minnesota, at least. What happens is they tend to have a little bit later of a season, maybe, you know, one to two weeks later than what we used to deal with. So that kind of matches up pretty well with the reports we're getting that you know, people are having more issues with weevils and a longer season of issues there. So it's really kind of complicating our normal uh, management tactics where we'd say focus on first cutting. Once you're past that, you're good. Not so much anymore. It's looking like first and second cuttings we're running into issues. So combined with our resistance issues, that's really getting into a perfect storm um, with alfalfa weevil there. I do want to mention briefly uh, potato leaf hopper. This is one that um, is another pest that we deal with. It's migratory, it blows it from the south. So basically what happens here, it becomes a late season pest. It takes time to build up in our fields. Um, but one of the things is that it really kind of depends what you're looking at in your fields if you're going to see issues with it. There are resistant plants out there. Um, basically, they can tolerate a higher number of plant hoppers out there. But both for potato leaf hopper and alfalfa weevil, the other things you can look at are your grass mixes you include with alfalfa. If you have orchard grass or other things in there, if you don't have a pure stand of alfalfa, that helps keep the numbers down. Um, you don't kind of get that critical mass of just a um, you know, great resource all across the board of the field. Um, so it kind of helps dilute the numbers out a little bit. All right, so we use a similar foliar insecticides for potato leaf hopper there too. Um, so that table I had before is pretty much going to be the same. Um, we have the options out there too. If you haven't seen it before, uh, hopper burn is what we get in that case. Uh, it's kind of this V-shaped yellowing on the plant from their feeding. And usually it's going to be uh, kind of a situation where you're looking at maybe first planting alfalfa. That's where you're going to have the highest pressure um, or potential for damage in that case. As you get to um, more established stands, it's plants that have you know gotten older. If you wait a long time for mowing, you might see more plants like this, but they can tolerate a higher amount of uh, potato leaf hopper pressure outside of those first year plantings. So it's one we maybe don't worry about every year, but keep an eye out for it if you get high numbers. Um, if you start to see damage like this, um, that's a good sign that you're uh, um, you know, seeing potato leaf hopper if it's just on edges, but keep an eye out for the rest of your field there. Um, so main thing here is we're looking at sweeping in that case for potato leaf hopper. You don't have to use that bucket method I mentioned earlier. So really just trying to get number of uh, average number of potato leaf hoppers per sweep. Uh, main thing there is just avoiding windy wet days. You're not going to get them, um, you know, you're going to get different numbers in the net just based on how sticky things are, if it's wet out there, or humid, and then also your field edges where they tend to congregate more. So uh, I just put these up here quick for economic thresholds, but they're separated out based on susceptible varieties, which most folks are probably planting, and then resistant varieties. So basically, again, like I mentioned, you can to tolerate higher numbers. So I've kind of hit on this point a little bit. Insecticide classes we use for these two are similar. So again, talk about alfalfa weevil, uh, limited options already. We're already getting more um, applications potentially if you have failures out there and an extended season. Now add in potato leaf hopper sprays, especially with pyrethroids and resistance there. Um, that's kind of just adding up more and more pressure for resistance issues. So. This kind of feeds into what we might be seeing for alfalfa weevil. Um, again, pesticide resistance, uh, maybe this new strain coming in, and then natural enemy populations decreasing, possibly because of our insecticide um, broad spectrum ones that we're using. Uh, those things just adding in there really seem to set up this perfect storm we're having for alfalfa weevil there. Um, one of the last things I'll stress here is make sure you check those pre-harvest intervals on your insecticides. Um, those really just kind of help guide a little bit what options work best for you there. Um, and I've had questions come up on that one too, where you know folks were planning on a, a spray and then they realized oh, they're actually too close to their um, harvest window there to make that work. So make sure we're going through the scouting here. That's really what we need to rely on for a fell weevil, especially. And you know it's kind of a tough situation here where we don't have any perfect recommendations uh, for alfalfa weevil. It's going to be a hard couple seasons for this one with limited options and potentially this extended season that's coming out there. So this is just the heads up that we are really need to change our recommendations there. 
and uh, kind of tilt into what's becoming kind of a resurgence of this old pest we've been dealing with. Um, one of the last things I would want to bring up, um, if you do have fields, you had to spray with insecticide, it's just more likely you're going to see problems coming in the future. Is that more just a correlation thing where obviously if you have an issue one year, um, you might just be in a field that uh, is more prone to it, um, but it could be that natural enemy and pest flare up thing going on too. So again, multi-pronged approach, avoid treatment if you can, mow, and then if you have to use your insecticides, make sure to rotate those, uh, especially with steward, that group 22, we definitely want to make sure we're saving that one there. All right, any uh, questions in the meantime, I have my email up here. Otherwise, uh, Craig, Nathan, feel free to uh, chime in if we have any questions here. All right, Anthony, let's, let's see if we can, there we go. All right, so we got about four questions here. Most of these are for you, Anthony, right out of the gate sure. here. So we'll start with those. Uh, Sean Collins here commented uh, that they have found feeding after first cut being the most detrimental as the, they feed on new shoots. And so the new growth won't come through, resulting in greater yield loss than feeding on larger plants. Uh, those larvae are difficult to spot and are in the ground at the crown. Uh, can you talk a little bit about identifying that risk and and how we might manage for that? Yeah, so that's a uh, kind of a different situation than we typically talk about with our scouting because we're going through foliage, obviously, uh, especially in that first cutting. Um, you can do ground scouting, and it is based on uh, the average number of larvae you find kind of per um, kind of unit area out there. But those are kind of a variable, kind of not as well tested thresholds out there, and um, I can't recall them offhand. Uh, we're going to try to get some more recommendations coming out on crop news uh, in the coming months here. that will include a little bit more on that one. But in terms of actually spotting on the ground, that's going to be tough. Um, we don't have any great way to actually, like we uh, can pick them up with the plants or a sweet nut. Um, so it's really just looking for signs that you have heavy feeding out there. Um, and maybe you can get ahead of it. But that's when we want folks to be careful too, where we're not you know, out there spraying kind of on a schedule and um, using up one of those group numbers. Uh, if you don't know, you have an issue either. So. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have, you know, great recommendations for that one. Usually we're kind of just hoping and waiting until we get a little bit later to see um, if we're seeing issues with defoliation again. Uh, you know, kind of feeding off that still here, two questions from Seth here. Would an insect growth regulator be appropriate? And two, so this is a two-part question here. Can I use a systemic insecticide against the larvae? Mm, so um, one of them actually... Bruce uh, Potter, our um, IPM specialist, just chimed in here too. Um, basically, if you have regrowth, uh, if you have delayed treat or crown feeding, um, that is number per square foot that we're looking at. Um, so I'll cover that one. Uh, back to the questions here. Um, in that case, insect growth regulators, that's one where I'd be a little cautious. Um, if it's mixed with something else, there may be some, some additional efficacy but the way those growth regulators work is it can basically delay development. Well, for other insects, that's a great thing. For the larvae here, you're holding them at that growth stage. Um, so if, let's say you have fourth instar larvae. Um, if they're not going to develop as quickly, but they'll be feeding more, uh, you might get more damage potentially. Um, that's when I still, I have to dig into more myself on that one. Um, so I'd be careful with those, but check and see what they um, have on the labels for those. And if there's uh, some actual efficacy trials with those growth regulators, um, then maybe we could uh, see if there's some good efficacy that results in that. But I'd be careful about those ones. Uh, Nathan, what was number two there? Uh, just to, I think you answered the question, can I use a systemic insecticide oh, against the larvae? Yep. Um, uh, systemics actually, uh, it can vary. So we think about organophosphates I had on that list, uh, pyrethroids and steward, none of those are systemics. Um, so there's challenges too. I think partly we don't use um, foliar neo neonicotinoids out there. That would be systemic. Um, I'm not aware of any of those labeled for alfalfa. And I'm assuming it's probably partly because uh, pollinator risk. Um, if someone did go to flowering, you have a field with a lot of uh, neonic concentration out there, um, probably be running into regulatory issues there. And that may be why that's not approved there. Um, I can't think of any offhand that are systemic that would work in that case there. Okay. I've actually got a question based off of that because, you know, 
when I was in central Minnesota, we dealt with a lot of issues where we were spraying first cutting. They were coming into second cutting. We're spraying second cutting, coming into third cutting. We're looking late July, early August, and we're already dealing, we're still dealing with alfalfa weevils. If you're spraying and you're trying to prevent yourself from you blowing through your, your act, modes of action there, how do you manage for that? Yeah. Um, and kind of, I was hinting at it a little bit. It's kind of, unfortunately, luck of the draw a little bit. If you can get lucky and not have to spray, that's the easiest situation. But yeah, what happens if you are looking like you have to treat every crop pretty much, um, or at least, you know, three crops at least, because uh, like those pictures I had about Alexandria that was getting into third cutting that was going to be affecting things there um, in some cases. So yeah, if you can rely on early mowing, and let's say you're just about a treatment threshold, you mow early, and it looks like, okay, you're holding okay. Um, I got away with one without a spray in the first cutting maybe. Um, that's one way to do it. But again, it's not foolproof. You need to be out there scouting. Um, and that's mostly what I tell folks is if you can be out there scouting, if you can catch those windows where you know you don't have to spray, that's really the best situation. Once you get past that, um, yeah, what do you do? Because if you want to save a group number for another year, you can try to do that. Um, but the thing to avoid, especially, is repeating the use of that same insecticide in the same year, too. So, again, if you suspect pyrethroid resistance issues, the most um, you know, likely situation now um, after an initial application, definitely don't use that one again. Um, but if you're using organophosphate, and get an issue later in the year, um, not because of insecticide failure, but just because the population is built up again. Um, that's the case where I'd say, you know, yeah, definitely try to look at another group number in that case. But keep that one in mind, um, especially the group threes. Uh, yeah, try to avoid those if you really suspect any potential issues there. And that's unfortunately the best advice we have right now. And that's why we had to shift the recommendations and kind of say the group numbers are so limited. That's just the situation we're stuck with right now. Um, I did mention Spinosa. That is another group number, um, but expensive. Uh, even organic growers I've been talking to have kind of been uh, balking it, you know, thinking about, okay, do we really need to use this one or not? Is that going to actually give us return on investments? So that's why I don't mention that one as much, but that is another potential one to look at. Um, but otherwise, it's really down to two or three group numbers to rotate through. So question based off of that outside of spinoza are there other good options for insecticides for organic growers outside of that well one of the other options i was talking to a guy with about yesterday actually is um so there's pyganic which is basically um the natural version of our pyrethroids so it's the same group number same chemistry and all that um but unfortunately because we're talking about resistance there it's going to be the same issue with that now um you know if they're based on their field history maybe they won't have issues with that quite yet so they can maybe get away with using that. Um, I also did see um, some of the products out there will have uh, the pyrethrin, that's in that pyganic product, uh, plus other things like neem oil. Um, that one could help out a little bit too. I've seen those uh, some trials with that one that have worked to some degree there too. So it's basically for those growers, it's kind of those two options, spinosad and then a um, pyrethrin product that might have some other mixtures in there too with things like neem oil. Okay. And then uh, have we seen any effects of irrigation on these weevils Any it, it, that we should be aware of? Yeah, I, I haven't seen anything that would specifically point to you know, any benefits. I mean, the crop is hopefully healthier. Like I mentioned with that one field, um, it was really a, the drought was really kicking in by Alexandria. So it was really the middle of the field up on this hill that was getting hit hard. Um, but directly on the larvae, um, you know, maybe you could get uh, some more of these um, antipathic uh, fungi that attack the larvae, but I can't say for sure if we're going to see increased efficacy with that one there. And again, they're pretty protected in the plant. They're, they can hold on to it pretty well. So uh, heavy rain, you know, can affect some insects. These ones, um, you know, they can be pretty mobile and they can get back up on the plants. So I'm, I'm not banking too heavily on irrigation helping us out there. Uh, to a high amount, at least with the larvae. Okay, Greg, I believe this one's directed at you. Uh, are there alfalfa bet alfalfa varieties better at nitrogen fixing? Yeah, interesting question. So, you know, the the USDA ARS unit 
at St. Paul has studied biological nitrogen fixation. And there was one particular non-dormant alfalfa nitro that was released several years ago. And it did have higher levels of biological nitrogen fixation, um, but never really became commercially viable. Uh, as far as I know, uh, if you look at all of the commercial lines that are available to producers, there has been no selection for biological nitrogen fixation among those. So um, there are many other, if you're looking at, if you're looking at availability of alfalfa nitrogen to the following corn crop, um, probably there there are so many variables that affect that, that the differences in nitrogen fixation among varieties would be really pretty minimal, wouldn't be a factor there. So Great. the answer is no. <laughs> Great, you know, I, I can't think of any that, you know, are that much better. You know, just, just so you know, this whole issue of of selection for biological nitrogen fixation is, is a very interesting one from a plant physiological perspective because you realize the more nitrogen you fix, you're going to give up carbon that could be used for growth. So there's a trade off there. And um, so, and plant breeders haven't dealt with that trade off. They've been selecting for yield or, or disease resistance or other, other traits. So Craig, we had a question from uh, Bruce Potter here too for you. Um, he's wondering just with our alfalfa weevil management related to cutting, how does that relate to um, you know, more on the agronomic end of thing for cutting philosophy? Well, I was gonna, I was thinking about this very issue because, uh, you know, uh, we have been promoting harvesting of alfalfa at a bud stage to early flower. And we really focused a lot on the dairy, the dairy business, dairy industry, trying to get, you know, high digestibility, high protein. And I was thinking, well, what if we start talking about going to three cup treatment? Well, for the dairy ration, you should be able to balance you know, use the alfalfa fiber, the pro protein you have, but compared to corn silage, the digestibility is, is an issue with the whole plant corn silage. So maybe we should treat alfalfa a little different in dairy rations. Now, that said, if you went to a three cut system, um, how would that work? And you can tell me how that interfaces with the, the alfalfa weevil. First thing, the first cut really has to come off in southern Minnesota before the 1st of, of June, because there's too much leaf loss that goes on there, too much opportunity to get rained on forage. So we've been advocating, cut, take that off. So let's say it's May 25th. Nathan, I think your data would support this too for central Minnesota with the scissors cut program. So um, then you have the rest of the season. So if you at that point went to a 45 day cutting interval or 40 day and got two other cuts, you'd get better yield and better persistence, but lower quality, okay? And lower yields. So if you may run that second cut out at 40 days, how's that gonna affect uh, the alfalfa weevil cycle? It doesn't sound like it's gonna help on this Western, Western alfalfa weevil at all, right? Yeah, it's tough to say um, that they're always going to be there developing one way or another. Um, so they're not going to change much based on the cutting cycle, just more when um, you target those cuttings and maybe get a little bit extra control or I kind of call it like a pseudo insecticide application in a way. So it's, um, yeah, just depends more on what uh, amount or populations people have in their fields when that cutting happens. Well, and something here, I've I've got a kind of a question related to all of this because we're looking at mowing 
And, you know, looking at some of the fields that you have there, Anthony, on some of those pictures where it's clear where the windrow, where the feet, you know, where the forage sat after mowing, they're feeding underneath there. And that's where you kill those plants. How do we manage our, you know, our mowing width so that we still dry down in time because we want to get that off as soon as possible, but also open up that underground canopy so this goes for craig too how do, how do we manage that so that we could get the maximum kill on these alfalfa weevils while at the same time still being able to get forage off or alfalfa off in a manner and get it at a moisture that we could put it up safely for for feed how to you know how do we balance that out do you want me to respond both of you if you can <laughs> Well, so I saw that picture that he showed with that alfalfa, the alfalfa stems that were left in this regrowth in the field. And I think, ah, oh, what the heck happened there? You know, well, the weather happened. Someone didn't time things properly. You know, there's a lot of interaction. Um, I really think that we re ought to be promoting as much as we can uh, Strategies like baleage, where you can harvest the forage off at higher moistures, you know, let's say it's 40 to 60% if you want to make kind of a hay or chop as haylage. So what you could do is on those fields where you know you have a weevil population, is make sure you target those to cut, get off early or as soon as you can after cutting. And baleage, you know, depending on the weather, of course, you know, maybe the morning after you can harvest it, you can get it off the field. So you can avoid the weather damage. Uh, and that's, you know, that would be my approach to get it off. Now, you get through, you put it in a, rock, a wide swath when you run through your conditioner, you get it drier quicker. Um, maybe you don't have to tur turn it or maybe you turn it once, but the key is monitor the weather and then get that off as quick as you can. And traditional haymaking really works good in, in July and August. But we know in the spring and in the fall, it can be more problematic in a lot of Minnesota. And that's where you get that situation. It's kind of just, it's disheartening, right? To see that, because you know, you lost half the crop already. So you might as well chop it back on the field. One thing I, I've been kind of thinking about too is um, I think about when you're raking up the hay. So uh, your initial windrows after mowing, um, if you can't get those raked up. That seems like where I'm seeing more of the damage. Um, and this is anecdotal at this point. But if it's a point where you, know, you at least manage to get it raked up, um, you know, combined into uh, one there, but then think about it's, you know, kind of fluffier. It's still some air exposure going in there. Um, you know, that if you could at least get to raking first, um, I'm wondering if that might have some benefit um, compared to when uh, you're kind of just stuck with right after mowing and you really can't get out in the field and do anything. Um, so it's kind of a, it all again depends on what works for people with their schedule, but that might be the higher risk situation is right after mowing is kind of what I'm guessing, but um, sometimes not a lot you can do about that. So something interesting here and Anthony, I'm going to ask you to, try to at least approach this uh bruce here mentions you know there are other things under those windrows not just alfalfa weevils and that's important to note so things like variegated cutworm for example are we even having an impact with this and and what do we need to be watching out for because we do know that there are other things outside of weevils this is a big topic but you know what you know what what can we expect and and how do we manage some of those in accordance with what we're talking about yeah, so um, I mentioned, you know, taking that sweet nut out in your alfalfa, you are going to find a whole bunch of things out there. Some, a lot just aren't even pests. They're just kind of hanging out there or real minor things. Um, but yeah, Bruce is saying it looks just like weevil damage out there, um, if you do find it. Um, personally, that's one I, I've not seen a whole lot of yet. So I think it's one, a lot of our cutworms, they're really kind of sporadic. They'll hit certain areas harder some years. Um, so that's one kind of keep an eye out for. But if if you're not finding alfalfa weevil, but you're finding larger cutworms out there and you're seeing something that looks like weevil damage, um, that's what you'll be looking for. Um, but some of our other ones out there, so like um, aphids in this case, 
that's that kind of one that been catching people by surprise a little bit. Um, but that's one where, you know, it's kind of people are a little more used to dealing with aphids and other crops. So that's one that, um, you know, hopefully folks are kind of, you know, aware of being able to look for those a bit. Um, we have some resources on the extension website uh, for aphids as well and other insects out there. So I think that's the main one where, um, depending on what people are dealing with, because there's so many potential kind of either minor sporadic pests out there, um, definitely take a look and uh, see what they're um, possibly finding out there and what the recommendations are for those. Because, uh, yeah, there's potentially a lot we could walk through with those ones there. Well, and Craig, this brings up an even more interesting question based off of that, at least more interesting for me, which is what do we do in these cases where we're, you know, you look at some of those pictures again, where in that windrow, clearly we've got feeding underneath and it's clearly killed the stand underneath where, you know, where that field is 30% missing. What is our management looking like? What are we going to do in those situations? I know some growers have talked about, they just went out and they plowed up a second year stand in, in near Pine Island. Uh, I was on their second year. They already plowed it up because they saw this. So, uh, what is our recommendation in this case? Can we plant grass strips? Is that going to help us out or, or are we just better off cut, plowing that under? Yeah, um, interesting question. Uh, and I hate to have to deal with this kind of situation because you get, it's not the whole field that's damaged. It's, it's a small area of the field. Those windrows, I don't know how far they were apart, 30 foot apart or something like that. Um, and um, what you can do, depending on your long-term goals, is you can go in and seed a mixture of red clover and uh, uh, ryegrass, annual ryegrass or Italian ryegrass. That's one option um, to put in that in there. And then I always worry about, am I going to do as much damage to the existing plants when, you know, by doing this as I'm gaining? So you would need to time it in a way and perhaps do it right after the, the one of the cuttings occurs. You could, you could, you know, whether well, the plants are uh, kind of just stubble with no regrowth, but that's what I would do if you want to salvage it. Go through, I would use a no-till drill and drill right over that, that uh, strip. Okay. Well, I, I've only got a few questions left here. So again, if anyone else has questions, uh, please put that in the Q&A box. Uh, Craig, you mentioned ice sheeting. Uh, how do we how do we manage ice sheeting in this instance if we do run into it? We do have a lot of standing water in fields as well as some ice in southeastern Minnesota, especially where we're thawing out quickly and not draining off very quickly. So uh, are there concerns there and what should we be looking for? Well... Like I said, if you if you get the coverage and it for alfalfa, if it lasts for three to four weeks, you got a real problem. So I've not done research on how to break up ice sheets, but um, I can give you some suggestions. One of them, if you leave stubble in your alfalfa field, that has been shown to uh, break up the ice sheets or allow passage of gas. CO2 really produced from respiration and oxygen movement. So the first thing I would say, stubble in the field the fall, from the, fall, the previous fall. That's a great aid. Um, then when you have an ice sheet, it is likely going to be in a lower part of the field. Um, I have anecdotal information that if you run over it with a rotary hoe, if it isn't too thick, okay, and there's a lot of ifs here, then that will aid in breaking up, breaking it up. Um, I've also heard um, anecdotal information about putting fertilizer down on top of it, put down potash on top of it, and it does take a lot of potash to break up ice like that, though. So um, I've heard going over it with a disc. And, um, but again, anytime you run tillage equipment over an alfalfa stand like that, what's, what are the pros and cons need to be weighed on those? So um, I wish I had a, a, a clear cut way to deal with ice sheeting, but I really don't. 
you know, frankly, um, you know, although we can get ice sheeting over a whole hundred acre alfalfa field, usually it's localized. And I would say to be proactive, plant something different in those low parts of the field to begin with. Plant a grass, uh, whether it be, you know, I know a reed canary grass has some, some resistance to, to ice sheeting, so does Timothy. You can plant grasses in those areas. So you don't have to set yourself up for a heartache when your alfalfa dies. Something else you mentioned. Yeah, I don't know the answer. <laughs> I mean, that, yeah, it's good a good answer there. Uh, or it seemed, uh, but with heaving, you mentioned heaving as well. How do we check for heaving? And at what point should we be concerned with, with that particular issue? So, um, you know, um, this is the time of the year, March and April, where alfalfa is very, very uh, vulnerable in general. Um, who knows what the weather's going to be, but if the snow melts and the alfalfa breaks dormancy and it gets cold again, it can get cold in early May, we can have frost on those plants. Uh, when that happens, particularly to, to some of the entries which have lower dormancy, we can have injury to them. The, um, the timing of all of this, measuring things, is, is a bit of a wait and see. Um, I would say one needs to go out in early May and make that a, a assessment for whatever happens during the winter. And if you do have, for example, heaving with, with crowns that are here and alfalfa that are heaved more than an inch out of the ground and it's a large proportion of the field, then you probably ought to plan on rotating the corn. If it's small parts of the field, as it may often be, you can intercede those like we just talked with ryegrass and red clover. By the way, the reason I don't recommend alfalfa after alfalfa is because it's alleopathy. But we know that it happens. So if you have an, an older stand of alfalfa, seedling it doesn't matter, but an older stand and you go in and you try to put seed, alfalfa seed into there, it's probably not going to be successful. Nathan, right, before well, I forget, um, we did have questions on corn rootworm and alfalfa. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, I think you actually asked me about this one earlier last week. Uh, so that is one where if you have high adult numbers, um, you might see Western corn rootworms feeding in alfalfa. Um, again, it's just the adults. Uh, they're not getting into the roots on your plants or anything like that. But if you have that high of numbers, um, definitely just keep in mind that, you know, next year in that field might be high risk corn rootworm. Um, but more likely, it's just saying that you also have high numbers in your nearby corn, too. So um, probably a good indicator. It might be time for changes in management for that one there. Um, but alfalfa, you, you should be pretty safe there. You need a pretty high amount of foliation to actually justify treating for those adults. Um, in most cases, I would say it's probably just going to be nuisance levels. But people have definitely been calling in, um, seeing adults feeding out there at least. All right, we're coming up on time here. Anything else for the good of the cause? All right, here, nothing. Uh, thank you for everyone here today for attending this Strategic Farming Let's Talk Crops program. Again, to our sponsors, the Minnesota Soybean Research and Promotion Council and the Minnesota Corn and Research Promotion Council for sponsoring this here today.